All right. Hi. Um, welcome back to conversation um, number two, our second conversation for the three sides to every adoption. Um, I'm Sarah Easterly. I'm an adoptee and I'm joined by Kelsey Ranyard. <laughs> Sorry, Kelsey. It's a mouthful. <laughs> Kelsey Vanderfleet, Ranyard, birth parent, and Lori Holden, who's an adoptive parent. Welcome both of you and hi. Hi, Sarah. This is the second of our three, three sides conversations. And um, what was great is we got feedback from the first one that we did last week on names and naming newborns. And so um, we wanted to address what's kind of an elephant in the room. Um, and that is, why are we talking together? Um, there were some, there was some feedback that was, that was good. It, you know, we, we welcome the feedback, um, because it points to what's needed, um, and maybe what's not needed too. So in some cases, so it, uh, it kind of forces us to listen and do what we, um, kind of practice what we say we're about, and that's the listening and hearing each other. And, um, so we thought we just, talk through that. Um, three sides, these three sides, um, you know, there's some who take issue with uh, the term even triad because there are more than just these three sides to adoption. So we recognize that for sure. We're, we're part of the constellation, but um, historically adoptees and birth parents haven't really had a voice um, and haven't been uh, the key drivers in adoption, of course, um, for birth parents it's a very vulnerable moment um, to become a birth parent, a vulnerable situation. And so it may not feel like you have a choice. And for adoptees, of course, um, most of, well, in the cases we're talking about, I don't want to get into foster care right now, but um, for infant adoption there or very young children being adopted, there's no choice. It's before we have a, a say in the matter. Um, and others are deciding what happens for us. So we thought we'd address why the three of us are talking and why we think it's important for um, others in, the, in this triad. We will say triad for this conversation, keep talking. So um, I can start or I can bounce it over to you, Kelsey, Lori, or, or Lori, yeah. <laughs> I just wanted to start by saying it's really, easy for an adoptive parent to answer the question, why listen to adoptees and birth parents? And we are lauded for doing so. And we are rewarded for doing so because it helps us better function as the power center of the adoption triad. Um, so my answer is very easy. It makes me a better mom, a better, um, a better person when I understand the other perspectives. Now, I think you two have a lot more complexity in your answer. Why would you listen to other people? So I'll ask you that. Um, for me, I think I'm kind of, we're kind of the like, uh, I don't know if isolated is the right word, but we kind of are an isolated part of the triad because we don't, we're not there every day. Um, we're kind of off to the side. And so there's a lot about the other two sides that are very unknown for us. And we are also very unknown to the other two sides oftentimes. So I think for me, I want to better understand my child who I don't, I don't know very well um, as they're growing up. I have an open adoption, but that doesn't mean I'm there every day. I don't, I have a child that I parent and a child that I placed and I don't know my child that I placed nearly as much as I know the child that I parent every day um so yeah that's that's part of it I want to understand I also want to play my title is birth parent so I want to play the part of a parent as much as it's appropriate for me to um as much as I'm needed to so it because I'm a birth parent I'm, I, it's an adult role um, with, and it comes with responsibility. And so I want to listen to adoptees for that reason um, so that I can play my role in the way that I'm needed to. And then also um, why I listen to adoptive parents as well is I want to better understand my child's parents and I don't, 
um, I, I want it to be a, a positive, healthy relationship with them. Because I think that when we have positive relationships um, stretching across from birth parent to adoptive parent, that um, is a good thing for our children. And um, also just as human beings, I want to understand both sides as well. Um, I think I think that's always healthy to um, recognize the humanity that each of us carry. So, you know, Kelsey, in all my years of being in adoption world, I have never really understood that point that you brought up first about one of the about being kind of in the margins of things and wanting to um, become included. I think that's so profound. Yeah, it's it's a little it's a little weird. I think. I started noticing too when I, I started building like um, for work, I started building a database of like therapists for birth mom because it's so hard to find them. And I would go and they would say, we have adoption therapy and stuff, but it was for the adoptee and the adoptive family. <laughs> and so I'm like, there's a lot of things, that's just one aspect, but there's a lot of things that kind of put us on the outside looking in um, and and you know that's the if that's my role that's my role, um, but to better understand you do have to listen. So thank you for sharing that. That that's that's really meaningful to me too. And I'm thinking about you too being a second generation adoptee. Um, and there's probably um, insight you get as well, <laughs> thinking about your parent who was yeah. an adoptee and how that affected the way you were raised, I'm sure, I know. Yeah, Sarah, do you wanna explain that term you know? just so people know? Cause I had never heard of it until you said something. I will, and um, I can't remember if we got in the conversation. I mean, I think, I, I, think I've, I first heard the term through Ostrid Castro um, and she tells the story that her, her daughter made that term up. So I think there's discrepancy. On, okay. I mean, I've heard other people say, maybe it's not second generation adoptee, maybe that means something else. But anyway, the way I take it is that <laughs> my children are second generation adoptees. I as the adoptee now, they, they are not adoptees. They're biological to me, but they are second generation because they are coming from an adoptee, um, their offspring of an adoptee. And yeah, that would be- I guess I would be- a third generation then because it's like my dad's an adoptee and then his birth mom is an adoptee as well right that kind of blows your mind too like how does that yeah yeah you're, you're well in the adoption constellation <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah yeah um I will answer that that question of why um, why talk to adoptive parents and to birth parents um, because I know um, I know sometimes there are even questions of of that for from other adoptees um, and there's a there's several reasons I think um, I think one of them is I really like helping um, <laughs> you know and some of that's probably some there's probably some adoption uh, residue there that makes me want to be a helper. Um, and help, but I think of um, things I didn't grow up with when I was a young adoptee and things being information. Um, you know, there was, there, there weren't, there wasn't an ability, you know, and this is going to date me and make me sound like I'm old fashioned as my kids would say, but there wasn't an ability for adopt for this, for anyone to just make a video and upload it and give information. There wasn't, there weren't very many books. There wasn't the history to look at mental health and how that affects adoptees for the long term. Um, advice that was given, you know, nobody knew that it was a social experiment. It was just an experiment. And now we know. And so I want to help um, future generations of adoptees in whatever way that is. So, um, you know, I don't always like what I see in adoption. There have been a lot of um, practices that are very unethical um, and, um, and that dates way back. Um, that doesn't to me mean all adoption um, is unethical. And so I'm able to see, see the both. And in the meantime, we have adoption here and there are human adoptees growing up in families where they need they need support and so I like 
being able to help that and offer offer my opinions um, and my thoughts. I'm just one adoptee, so I don't have all the answers um, and I don't represent all adoptees and all perspectives and all experiences, but um, where it can be helpful, I'd like to help. Um, I said this in the last episode, but it's really healing to be in um, community when it's not personal. So Kelsey, you're not my birth mom and Lori, you're not my adoptive mom. And so um, if, if things come up, it just doesn't feel personal. Um, we had something the other day where we were talking about therapy and I got, had some heat <laughs> and I, you know, said that. And what I really appreciated is if that were in a personal family situation, I could see that being an instant like family drama. And it was like, it, it didn't feel personal in any way. What, what you said, Lori, and then I hope when I, the way I said it reacted with heat didn't, hopefully didn't feel personal either. And so there's this healing component that we can have real conversations about things and um, just talk about these issues when it's not talking about the people specifically. We're not talking about each other. We're talking about the issues. Um, so it would, yeah, it's, that just feels really healing and it feels healing to be in community with um when i see it's inspiring it's inspiring it would be like putting um you know a a, a very strong democrat and a very strong republican in a room and you know it's it it can these conversations are so so political and can get so heated um and so it is healing to be able to have those conversations and it heals a part of me that like maybe I couldn't do that in the past for any number of reasons. Um, but oh, that's the adoptive parents perspective. That's the birth parents perspective. I hadn't been, I was either too afraid to ask or it was too politically volatile or too uncomfortable, too shaming to ask that. But I get to ask it here and I get to like heal a little part of my my wounded soul, my woundedness, that those wounded parts that are always going to be there, but like just kind of chunking away at, oh, that, that, that felt good to hear that, <laughs> or I see it in a new way and that feels good. I think there's so much in um, the world of adoption that's comes from misunderstandings and assumptions that come out of those misunderstandings. And we had, we had this in the therapy talk conversation we talked about. And um, when you leave a misunderstanding without finding clarification or some kind of resolution, and then you base your forward path on that misunderstanding, you can just see how it's like going to go to the wrong, you're pointed in the wrong direction. So you're going to go in a place that maybe not be um, the whole picture. So I, I think that's part of what I get from listening to the two of you and other birth parents and other adoptees is I, it helps me resolve and check my own understanding and have develop a practice of checking for misunderstanding. Cause if I'm making assumptions, um, I'm likely wrong <laughs> and I don't want to act on those assumptions that are wrong with my child, especially with my children. Can I ask you Lori, um, about, there is often an assumption that adoptees are angry. And I think we get labeled as angry adoptees and often written off and discounted if, if we're angry. And so that's why I appreciated that I could have some heat the other day and you still, you didn't hang up. <laughs> we were still in conversation, but can you speak to that generalization? And um, I guess what it means to like how you, how you can still listen even when, we get angry. I mean, maybe that's good, good for other adoptive parents or good for any of us who are dealing with someone who's angry. How do you keep listening? Yeah. Anger is an emotion that I think a lot of people want to um, not feel. And um, what I found <laughs> one, one of the buzzwords that's come out of my podcast that I, from listening to other guests is do your own work people specifically aimed at adoptive parents. The more we can do our work and, um, be okay with these big emotions that our children have, the more we can sit with their big emotions and let them have them. So I, I have been trying to do that work of being able to sit with anger without reacting to it, definitely without reacting, and then responding, which is more of a conscious choice in a way that best serves who I'm, who I'm talking, who I'm with. And it's hard. It's really hard. And I do see 
that um, that assumption that adoptees are angry. And, you know, I, I also see that they're not. And so to make a sweeping generalization about any group of us is not helpful. It's a shortcut and it makes your deal, you know, your reactions to things really easy because if all adoptees are angry, then I know what to do when I get hit with an angry adoptee, I block them, I do whatever, but there's nuance in there. And what else am I blocking that I, that I do want to come through to make my decisions better. So, um, I just like, I, I just don't, you know, a lot of people say my adoptive parent was bad. So all adoptive parents are bad. And I get that. If you don't feel safe with an adoptive parent, your own adoptive parent, you can't afford to be accessible to other adoptive parents. I get that. But it's as untrue to say about adoptive parents being narcissists or control freaks or whatever it is. Some are, some aren't. Some are, even the ones that are, are not probably not always like that. They have their triggers and their reactions. And um, so I, I just think the more we can deal in the nuance and the complexity um, for the situation that is in front of us and not the assumptions that we bring into it, um, the more benefit we can get out of it. But that's a luxury because that means that you've, you're feeling safe in the situation. Yeah, that's a really good point. The safety is a really good point. And that came up, um, that came up a little bit uh, last week, uh, for sure, in our, in response to the last video. Um, Kelsey, question for you. Um, the other day we were, when we were kind of figuring out what this topic would be, we were talking about how um, the dilemma, and you touched on this too, I mean, there aren't uh, as many birth parents in conversation. Um, and what's how do we get how do we get how do we address that i mean is it addressable and why and how can we get get more birth parents in the conversation and i know you do a lot of work in that that arena so you you have you see more but how do we get them more visible yeah i think it i you know i think first and foremost it starts from uh you know the field of adoption um and how they how they're even how they even come to this um, in the first place, how, you know, whoever they call to help with their adoption um, it has a huge impact on, you know, how they, how they're going to end up viewing their decision, how they're going to end up um, being supported after their decision, if at all. And so I think the support, you know, has to start obviously in pregnancy. But when it doesn't, it's really hard to get those women in, um, you know, our orbit for community. And so I see women like last year, I remember I, this happened several times, but one sticks out to me because she's from my hometown and we had mutual friends and she placed 10 years ago and I placed uh, almost six years ago now. And um, I had found a support group the same year I placed, not any help with my professional, but I just sought it out. And, uh, but there was more like online and stuff where you could Google things and versus 10 years ago, it might've been a little tougher, but she was like, I didn't even know, like, like they didn't, she didn't even know her title, like that she was a birth mom. Like no one ever told her that's what this is like that's what you become when you do this thing so like she didn't know that she didn't know that there was a support group which we connected her with and everything but like she just she had no idea people are like leaving the hospital without information and so then when that happens it's a whole lot harder to get those birth parents to come and talk or to even like have understanding of what they went through and how it's going to affect them and their child you know for the rest of their lives so that is a hard thing though like it's kind of like the million dollar question here like how do we get more birth parents to speak out and I think number one they have to feel supported they have to be um they I, it seems like it kind of seems to me like which came first the chicken or the egg when we're like she has to 
feel understood before she speaks out, but in order to understand them, you have to listen to them. So it is kind of, um, it's kind of a hard thing, but I think more and more, uh, just with the internet, women feel more compelled to speak out. But we do tend to notice, like my podcast um, partner, Ashley and I, we talk about this quite a bit too. Uh, we do tend to notice women will come out, talk about it, be in conversation for a couple of years, maybe like a year to three years. And then they're kind of like, okay, I'm done now. Whatever reason it, that, you know, caused her to do that, whether it was good or bad, whether it's acceptance or, you know, um, backlash or whatever, they kind of just fizzle after a few years. And I'm not really sure if there's one reason to attribute to that, but yeah. What, what you make me think of, Kelsey, is a safe space is key. You're calling it su supported. And yeah, when they feel safe, when people feel safe, they can speak out more vulnerably. And mm -hmm. if, um, I mean, one of the, uh, the, that you've mentioned before, one of the um, vulnerabilities that a, that a birth parent has in speaking out online is what effect will that have on their child's adoptive parents? And what kind of self-censoring do they have to do in order to retain access to their child? Yeah, and you know, it's also, they have a whole other community in their life that if they do speak out online, there's always that fear that someone from your family is gonna see it or something. And it's not to say that every adoptee is a secret because they're not. And, and it's obviously a lot more common now to you know share about your experience, but there are still people that um, like I don't talk to about my adoption. They know it's like we we know that they know, but I don't want their opinion. I don't want their comment. So that's another thing. If I see a lot of people make separate accounts for them to be in like a support group online or for them to have like an Instagram account where they talk about their experience because they don't want to share that with certain people in their life. So yeah, it's gotta be a safe space. Yeah. And that's one of the reasons why I value what we're doing here. And we're trying to kind of share that um, safety feeling um, by doing these videos, put this out in the world that it, it can happen where we can have real conversations, get into real issues, share our vulnerabilities and come away with better understanding. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And then go out and be better to each other. So Wouldn't that be so nice? <laughs> <laughs> That's my utopia, my adoption utopia. <laughs> It is. Well, and uh, everything is so siloed these days in so many different areas. I mean, adoption is one area, but um, so the practice for other areas, <laughs> it's good too, right? I mean, like we, this is what we need more of is this, is this um, being able to hear, listen and hear and stay in conversation. Yeah. Yeah. I will say that like, there are things about there are, there are aspects about community with just birth moms that I get so much healing from. And some of my best friends over the years are birth moms now because we just seem to understand each other on a different level. But then there are other times where it's like that too small of a bubble and I need to take myself out of that to gain a broader perspective, get um, maybe advice even in my own adoption triads that like, I'm not going to get from birth moms. Sometimes too, you have, you run the risk of like, you're in that close knit group. Like we kind of can enable each other to do things that are kind of destructive. And um, so it's important to listen to other sides just for that reason. So you're not constantly being enabled or enabling others. Like you're, you have a level head um, and second and third opinions. Yeah. Checks and balances are in place. I'm so yeah. glad you said that. And the same is true in the adoptee communities. I, I have a number of them, all just adoptees. And it's 
I, I would echo everything you just said um, with regards to the adoptee communities. I am so thankful for my <laughs> adoptee only spaces um, yeah. where you can just say what you need to say. And you've got, even if you've got the different experiences um, with, you know, I'm in um, writing groups with uh, that for adoptee voices with adoptees who um, male adoptees, late discovery adoptees, transnational, transracial, um, so many different, and yet we still have, we're like, oh, you get together and there's just this common, common understanding. Um, and, and it is really good to also be in other spaces. And I have this community. I also have, um, community through adoption mosaic where I'm, I'm together with other, other representatives, adoptive parents and birth parents. And it, it's really good to just go back and forth between these communities and see the differences yeah. and just not, um, yeah, I mean, it would, it would be really fun to stay just in the adoptees, in the adoption, adoptee world too. Um, but it's, it's a different thing that, that you get when you're in, in, a, in these cross communities with other. With a other. perfect example of the both and having both your tribe and your, the, you know, and also cross, cross tribes. Yes. Because yes. you get something from di different from each. Yeah. 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 Both and. <laughs> yeah. Well, is there anything else we wanted, we want to cover anything else to say about why, why we, why we talk? Why, why, why should we? Any, any additional thoughts that we haven't touched on Kelsey or Lori? Better understanding means less, less toxicity and who doesn't want less toxicity these days. <laughs> so I would like to, you know, I just want to always invite people to let us know what else um, we might want to talk about your take on what we've said today. What did we miss? What did we get right? Um, you know, the, we're, we're listening. That, that's what we want to, that's what we're doing. We're listening. We're listening. And it may not always be the three of us either. We've been talking about, um, we, we, you know, we are three, I just want to call it white people, white women. We have generational generations represented. Um, Kelsey as a millennial and myself as Gen X and Lori, I, I okay, boomer. You're a boomer. Yeah, I know. I can't believe you're a boomer. You don't seem like a boomer, but hey, we've got some generational. Yeah, we've got the, gen, we've got some generations represented. We don't, and we've got open and closed adoption represented. We don't have transracial adoption represented. We don't have transnational adoption, intercountry adoption representatives represented. So bringing in other perspectives is something that we, we like to do. Um, and we will, that will be coming as well in other ways. So, but yeah, please do comment, let us know um, what, what else you'd like to hear us talk about. And uh, <laughs> I think we have a whole long list going as well. So um, we'll keep at them. Great, thank you. Thanks for leading us, Sarah. Okay, take care. <laughs>